So this is uh, this presentation will discuss our systemization of knowledge paper on anti-facial recognition technology. I'm Emily, and this work was joint with my colleagues Sean, Heather, and Ben from the University of Chicago. Sean and Heather are there in person, so if you have follow-up questions about this paper after the session concludes, please feel free to seek them out or to find me on Whova. For those of you who saw our teaser, this is Bob, and for those of you who didn't, uh, meet Bob. Bob has some concerns about unwanted face recognition technology. He has been reading online about various services that have become available in recent years, like PIMIs and FaceCheck, which are free services that can recognize faces um, and are available to anyone. He's also read about a lot of different platforms that exist that sell face recognition technology to government and other entities around the world. His concerns are reasonable because there are, of course, legitimate uses of face recognition, but there are also illegitimate ones. And the more platforms there are, the more likely that an illegitimate use might arise. Beyond concerns about just unwanted surveillance and recognition, uh, there's significant privacy concerns with these sorts of systems because it uh, is sometimes the case that personal images are scraped online and used without consent in these systems. And while there's some legislation surrounding facial recognition in progress, um, such as laws in Texas, in Illinois, um, it's slow and it's not universal. In light of this situation, the question is, what could Bob do to prevent unwanted face recognition? Bob, being a you know savvy guy, goes to the literature and starts searching for suggestions in recent uh, papers. And he sees these suggestions to wear makeup or funky eyeglasses or poison training data, or all of these many, many things that you could surface if you're searching around Google Scholar for papers on avoiding face recognition. We recognize that this situation might have been a little confusing for Bob, and the goal of our paper was to help better systematize this space and lay out uh, the landscape and future of this sort of technology. To that end, our work systematizes the 30 plus papers that have been published on anti-face recognition technology in the last decade or so. Our paper creates a novel taxonomy of attack surfaces in facial recognition systems and uses this taxonomy to categorize and analyze existing proposed AFR tools, which is what we call anti-face recognition tools. Beyond this, we also identify design principles that we think are reasonable targets for future AFR tools and analyze how proposed or existing tools could uh, meet these design challenges. And then finally, we discuss open technical and ethical issues in this space. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna walk you through at a very high level, how we systematize this space, um, what our systemization ends up looking like and on our evaluation of these different methods, and then we'll briefly discuss challenges and future work. So we identify five key stages in modern face recognition systems that could serve as targets for anti-face recognition tools. The first stage is image collection, where providers of face recognition services collect data, um, either online or via picture taking with cameras. After collection, those images are pre-processed by some engine we call G. And that involves face detection, normalization, et cetera, to prepare face images for use. These collected pre-processed images can then be fed to one of three locations in a face recognition system. The first, stage three here, is they could be used to train a feature extractor, which is a deep neural network that's trained to map uh, images to fake feature vectors, and specifically to map similar faces to similar feature vectors. If they aren't used for this, they could be used for reference database creation. This database is what a facial recognition provider collects and curates uh, for identity matching. So they have these referen reference images of different people, they feed them through the feature extractor, and they produce feature vectors that are stored in a database for matching. 
And then finally, these images could be used for query matching, where at runtime in, in real time, the image is processed through the system and queried against that stored reference database to provide a match. So you can think about the left two stages three and four as facial recognition training and enrollment and the right as runtime recognition. So in our work, we believe that AFR tools can operate at each of these five stages. And so we use them to categorize and evaluate existing facial recognition proposals or AFR proposals, excuse me. So the first stage, if AFR tools target the first stage, uh, they would be trying to prevent image scraping or avoid image capture. Tools targeting the second stage would encompass things like adversarial patches that are meant to disrupt detection of faces or blurring methods that are meant to anonymize faces in images um, so that the processed image is not useful for face recognition. Tools that target the feature extractor training phase try to wholesale poison the training data set to corrupt it so that the trained extractor can't accurately map images to feature vectors. Tools that would target the reference database creation stage uh, would attempt to modify the images of a particular individual, so the reference database images of one person, and prevent the model, the face recognition system, from storing accurate feature vectors of that person for identification. And then finally, tools operating at the query matching stage target a single image that's being processed through the system and try and change it in ways that would prevent identification. So our paper groups all the existing proposals into one of these five stages. And you can take a look there to see more specifically some of the methods proposed for each. After we do this systemization process, though, we spend a fair amount of time evaluating what, whether proposals targeting different stages can achieve what we think are reasonable criteria for AFR tools. So we identify five different criteria that we think a reasonable AFR tool could or should achieve. And then we look at whether proposals targeting these different stages could achieve these criteria. The five criteria we look at in our paper are long-term robustness, which means do we think this or does this um, AFR tool provide long-term protection, even as facial recognition systems change? We also look at broad coverage, meaning that the tool provides protection for people who maybe already have an online footprint instead of just providing a one-time protection. Third party assistance refers to the necessity of involving someone else, trusting someone else to implement the tool for you, since people using AFR tools may not want that. And then finally, disruption to the user or others deals with whether the tool uh, causes an undue burden for the individual to use or causes some sort of problem for other people around them when it is used. And the goal of going through these criteria is to hopefully provide some guidance for future research in the AFR space, um, sort of providing more targeted directions for considering a future work. I'm gonna give you a very high level summary of what we find in our evaluation here, but again, the paper is going to be very helpful in giving you more insight into what we're writing here. So across the top of the table in the columns are these five criteria that I mentioned and down the rows are the different stages. And we mark each um, stage and criteria by one of three things. The black dot means that existing proposals targeting the stage already achieve this criteria, so we're kind of good. The white dot means that future proposals targeting the stage probably could, with some improvements, achieve this criteria. And the question mark means that some significant effort would be needed to make something targeting this stage work in this particular criteria. And it's unclear if success would be possible. So at the image collection stage, uh, it seems difficult to provide uh, broad coverage or to work without third party assistance here in preventing image collection. But these sorts of tools already do or could minimize disruption to the user and others and potentially provide long-term robustness because they would prevent image, uh, images from entering facial recognition systems in the first place. 
Tools targeting the data pre-processing stage do improve in the third-party assistance category, meaning that they don't require often another person to implement them for you. You can run a um, object detection prevention mechanism on your own, um, but they suffer some of the same limitations as image collection tools or anti-image collection tools. We believe the extractor training is a bit difficult um, because it requires wholesale data set poisoning. So it's hard to know if it could achieve many of these properties given the significance of that uh, effort for an individual. Database creation or tools targeting the database creation stage have more promise, uh, but they could be disruptive to other people in the system since it's unclear how AFR tools protecting one individual might affect others in the system. And then finally, tools targeting the query matching stage. Again, uh, the effect on other people is sort of unknown. And they also can't provide necessarily long-term robustness because they just prevent one-time identification. So again, please take a look at our paper for um, discussions of further discussion of this. Just to conclude with a few notes on challenges for future work in this space. The biggest one is that faces are static. And AFR tools are tasked with preventing identification of a static piece of data, which is difficult. Additionally, there's a lot of reliance in this space on adversarial machine learning based tools, which can kind of fall into a cat and mouse pattern and maybe not ideal for the future. And there's not a lot of work studying the privacy, usability and utility trade offs with these tools. And so that would be a very ripe vein for future work. Finally, there are ethical quandaries with this as well. I mentioned this at the beginning, but there's a lot of ambiguity in when facial recognition is appropriate, so therefore when AFR uh, tools are also appropriate. And there's also the challenge that facial recognition has reasonable use cases. And so the use of AFR tools may compromise some good uses of this technology. Um, and it's also understudied whether harm by uh, harm can be caused by AFR guided misidentification. So that's all the time I have for today. Thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to answer a few questions now. Any questions? Okay, if there are any questions, please introduce yourself because the speakers cannot see the room. Um, so Emily, uh, this is Shanchari here from the University of Denver. Um, I have one question. So when you were determining mm -hmm. uh, the evaluation criteria, such as robustness, disruption, like mm -hmm. what was the method mm -hmm. of determining uh, those five criteria for your evaluation? That's a great question. Thank you. So when, when we went through the literature to determine or to systemize, I, um, to systematize things in general, we tried to take a close look at how in the past literature people had evaluated the effect, efficacy of their different AFR methods. And so the criteria we identified were sort of an expanded, expansive set that encompassed most of the prior evaluation criteria that have been deployed. Great, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Sarah Scheffler from Princeton. Another question is how well do the different AFR techniques that you looked at actually work in both in the settings that they described and also perhaps in, you know, do, do the 2010 ones still work in 2023, for example? That's a great question. There's certainly been a lot of evolution in techniques since some of these were proposed. And while we didn't get into the nitty gritty of evaluating all of the proposed methods simply because the compute would be so intense. Um, that's definitely a, a great point to bring up. Like the 2010 methods are often targeting um, feature identification methods that are no longer in use. Um, so yeah, it's hard to know, but that's uh, an important question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And again, that's really valid with uh, like COVID and other uh, things, how technology change, but great work, Emily. And uh, let's thank the speaker again.